You're listening to the USSC Briefing Room, a podcast from the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney, where we give you a seat at the table for a USSC briefing on the latest developments in US news and foreign policy. We'll cover what you need to know and what's beneath the surface of the news. Hello, I'm Victoria Cooper, Research Associate at the United States Study Center. This episode is a roundtable briefing in which we'll discuss how Washington views Canberra. Today, I'm joined by Haley Channer, Director of the US Study Center Economic Security Program, and Professor Peter Dane, Director of the Center's Foreign Policy and Defense Team. Haley has led a diverse background, having worked as an Australian government official, ministerial advisor, think tank analyst, and has represented global nonprofit organizations. Haley was previously a senior policy fellow with the Perth US Asia Center and an assistant director with the Strategy, Policy and Industry Group at the Australian Department of Defence. Prior to arriving at the United States Study Centre in 2022, Professor Dean was the University of Western Australia's first chair of Defence Studies and the inaugural director of UWA Defence and Security Institute. He served as a pro vice chancellor at UWA and held a number of senior roles at the Australian National University's College of Asia and the Pacific and Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. Most recently, Professor Dean was co-lead of the 2023 Defence Strategic Review, where he served as a senior advisor and principal author. Let's dive in. Washington has made clear that it is pursuing an alliance-centric approach to strategic competition with China. While history has proven time and again that such an approach is essential to responding to revisionist powers, history is also littered with instances of failed alliances. Ultimately, a coordinated, multilateral and sustained approach amongst allies is perhaps easier said than done. Haley and Pete, you two have been around for some time, visited Washington many times, in fact, uh, earlier this month. Do you think we're in a unique period of time for the Alliance? I'm happy to jump in on that one. I would say definitely we are in a unique period. Uh, I mean, the Alliance is more than 70 years old now, but with AUKUS, with the changing strategic circumstances, And with the kind of new political challenges that the United States is facing after Trump and maybe before a second Trump presidency, there is a new vibe in the relationship between the two countries and I think a renewed sense of seriousness and gravitas about why we need to work together and why now it's important. And I definitely felt that when we were in Washington, D.C. in terms of the very high level meetings we were able to get and how candid a lot of both government officials and think tank and academics were with us. I mean, obviously the relationship's one where we're close mates and we really get along well and understand Americans. Uh, But as you dig deeper, there's always much more complexity to the relationship. And we realize, in fact, there are a lot of points of difference. So I think we need to work through a lot of different things as we go forward over the next couple of years. And we both confront this new period in our relationship uh, and you, Pete, what do you think? Are we in a unique period of time for the Alliance? Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, I wrote a piece um, last year, actually, beginning of last year, talking about uh, what are called ANZUS pivot points, which is about reappraising the Alliance for a new strategic age. And my argument in that was 2021 was a key pivot point in the relationship, and that it was a different pivot point to the ones we've had before. And In that paper, I go back and talk about pivot points in different parts of the alliance and sort of argue there's about every 10 years, there's a kind of a reframing or a pivot. But the one in 2021 was fundamentally different because it didn't just change the sort of character of our relationship, it changed the very underlying nature of that relationship. And that's been driven, as Haley said, by the changed strategic circumstances. What 2021 brought home, which was, you know, the beginning of the AUKUS deal, um, the announcement of AUKUS and uh, you know the US talking about integrated deterrence, you get really three key changes in my view that it's fundamentally making the relationship different. That's the end of US primacy in the region, you know, and that was acknowledged in the DSR that um, came out in Australia um, only recently. The rise of the Indo-Pacific as the centre of gravity of global competition, but a region now based on strategic competition on multipolarity and on um, a balance of power. And then of course, Australia's role in that collective um, integrated deterrence approach that the US announced in 2021, along with other US allies and partners such as Japan and the Philippines um, and even the Quad with with India. Um, And fundamentally that, you know, 
we like to talk about this notion of a rules-based global order. I have to say a term that does not resonate with the public from some other work that I've done. But um, that used to be a, a, an international order set up at the end of the Second World War that we knew in the West based on US primacy and US leadership. And now it's more of a much more multipolar world. And those rules are changing. Um, and so we're in a very different strategic era than what we have been in our relationship with the alliance in the past, particularly that we live in the most important geostrategic region now. Um, the tyranny of distance we used to enjoy in Australia has been replaced by the power of proximity. And at the same time, we're having the relative decline of the United States. So it's a very different era. Um, and this is adding new elements to, to the alliance relationship, such as AUKUS, um, that all the discussion about advanced science and technology, but also particularly post the war in Ukraine, not, well, not post, the war's still going, but since the start of the war, um, a much more emphasis on defence industrial cooperation as well. And I think, yeah, as you say, Pete, you know, we've been seeing all these pivot points and one of those pivot points is that our region of the world um, is becoming more and more important. And so I think Australia is featuring a lot more in alliance conversations with the US. So what do you think the US is looking to Australia to provide in terms of supporting the alliance? And Haley, I'll start with you again. Well, it's funny, Victoria. I went to Washington, D.C. for the very first time back in 2014. I was a young 20-something. And at that time, I was researching a topic about what can U.S. allies do for the United States? So it was a bit of a turn around the Kennedy speech about ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And at the time in 2014, Americans were telling me that the best thing Australia could possibly do for it is sign up to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And now I come back to Washington, D.C., you know, almost 10 years later, and we're in a totally different environment where it's now no longer the United States in TPP, but Australia is in the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, without the U.S., and the U.S. has launched this other thing called IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. In economics, there are lots of acronyms. In fact, I'm finding there's much more than there are in the defence world, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So if ever I felt locked out of a particular subject, um, at first it was defence and now it's economics. Um, but basically, I think, Victoria, the United States is looking for things from its allies. For many years, it's been asking for its allies in Asia to step up and spend more on their defence. I mean, in the Europe context, you have uh, European countries in some cases spending more and in some cases debating spending more on their defence because of Ukraine. In Asia, all of these countries are developing their militaries. Obviously, we're going to try and spend more than 2% of GDP on our defence and AUKUS is going to be a huge expense in that, some 300, and 300 plus billion dollars. Um, but the US is looking for a lot of things from Australia. I think it's very much looking towards Australia for help with the Pacific. Um, and in DFAT's just released a budget, we see more money going to the Pacific. So I think the US is looking to Australia to provide some guidance on how to best engage the Pacific because they have been our neighbours for forever and we know how to work with them. However, there's also this risk I've been told about that I've just learned is called Oz explaining, as in Australia explaining to America. Um, so we really are at risk of doing that if we try and overstep our mark and really tell them what we think they should do in the Pacific. So there's a, a real delicate balance we need to play in terms of providing guidance rather than um, instruction and making sure that countries in the Pacific aren't overwhelmed by the new attention that's been brought by things like China in the Solomon Islands potentially having a military base there and now huge US interest and engagement, opening new embassies. Um, but look, Victoria, I could talk um, you know, for hours on what the US expects of its allies. I think that's just one snapshot in this more challenging environment we face. Mm. And I might roll that into a new question for you, Pete. Um, from Washington's perspective, you know, we're seeing that Australia does have a role to play, um, but what are the priorities? You know, What are the immediate priorities for the alliance? Um, thanks for that. And that's, you look, know, I, I agree with everything Hayley said. And one thing uh, you, you've got to learn when you get to know Hayley, or particularly when you work with Hayley, acronyms is something that she does love. So she likes to not only learn those of the defense and, and economic sector, but also create new acronyms for us to use here at, uh, at USSC. I like to punish people <laughs> who are punishing me. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I think it's, you know, what we have to do is part of, part of the uh, International Security Club. Um, look, what I'd also say is, uh, you know, Australia hasn't been never more important to Washington, D.C. than since the Pacific War. Um, and that is, comes down to that the Pacific is, is more important. Asia is more important. Um, Coral Bell once famously said about the alliance, you know, the great international relations scholar, um, that Australia's interests, the uh, United States' interest in Australia is always relative to the US's interest in Asia. And, and now we're talking that context of the US Pacific, uh, Indo-Pacific. So the more and more the Indo-Pacific becomes of uh, strategic importance to the United States, the more they're interested in Australia. This is also spilling out, as Haley said, to strategic competition into areas that were once sleepy backwaters in, in, in the strategic realm of the South Pacific. In fact, if you go back to the Cold War, Australia was a very sleepy backwater. You know, we were down in the fourth or fifth level of priority because we were far away from the, the centre of gravity in Europe for that Cold War or even the contestation um, in, a, in a lot of that period that was happening in East Asia on the Korean Peninsula um, and places like that. So... Australia is much more important. Um, and one of the things I, I've really reflected on, this is my, the recent trip we had was my second trip that we had recently. I was lucky enough to go to Washington, D.C. when I was working for Sir Angus Houston and Stephen Smith on the Defence Strategic Review. And at the back end of both of those trips, the group we were with, so our group, um, but also the DSR group, sort of had this little reflective thing of how did everyone think that went? And the biggest overwhelming takeaway for me from both of those was just the level of access that we got, the level of interest in Australia, and the real frankness in US officials and think tankers in wanting to talk to us about the issues the US is facing and the region was facing, but also really listen to Australia's view. So, and, and you know, this is, I, I did a trip with a former foreign defense minister, with a former chief of defense force and chief of the Royal Australian Air Force. Um, also on our, in our delegation was a former minister councillor um, in Washington, D.C. during the Trump era and uh, a now major general in the army who'd been posted to America and stuff. And, and I've been going to the U.S. You know, for, for 20 odd years, almost every year with the exception of COVID. And for all of this, it's just, it's just phenomenal how interested they are in us. And I think that's reflective of why this is an asymmetric alliance. You know, there's a very big difference between the power of the United States and Australia. The gap in that asymmetry is shrinking radically. And this is because, because of this changing strategic order. The US knows they can't do things in the Indo-Pacific alone. As soon as you accept that fact, the alliance network they already had, which was important before, becomes absolutely central and critical now. So the rising interest in Japan, the rising interest in Australia in particular, is kind of like the, the northern and southern anchor point. Um, and of course, all the conversations I was having was about um, AUKUS and the DSR. So they wanted to know about the DSR. There's really positive feedback in the US about that because they saw that as, a, as forward leaning and, and its emphasis on the balance of power and emphasis on allies and partners in the region very much lined up with, with the US and Japan view, for instance. Um, but AUKUS you know, is really capturing the imagination of the think tank community and the administration. There's this funny thing in the US where sometimes it takes them a while to debate and argue and get their act together and um, that sort of stuff. But once they settle on something and the system slowly spins up, it really starts to get focused. And my takeaway from um, the trip, most recent trip is that the AUKUS piece, both Pillar 1 and now Pillar 2, has really spun up. And, uh, and I think one of the things that's a real risk is that um, the question for Australia and, and the United Kingdom in AUKUS is will we be able to keep up when the US system really spins up and starts going at a million miles an hour like, like it's capable of doing? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Something we're going to have to keep an eye out on. I do love the idea, just you know, on a personal and professional level, that Australia's never been more popular. You know, if there's any contest I want to win, everyone likes being popular, right? Everyone likes being the cool kid. Totally. If there's you know? any contest I want to win, it's the contest of popularity. So, do you know, embarrassingly, sometimes I ask American officials if they like Australian or Brits more. <laughs> I just want to know what they really think. Of course they say Australians, but I'm sure they say the same thing to the Brits. Well, there's like, isn't that that great YouTube clip of Obama where it's got him saying that, you know, the best friendship or the best alliance or the best relationship, and it just is him in 25 different countries saying exactly the same line. <laughs> I've seen it on YouTube floating around. It's when bands look behind their guitar to see the, the home city of the, that they're playing in. Yeah. 
And look, it's it's interesting. Like, you know, we have obviously been mates, if you want to use that term, but I hate, I've got to say, I hate the mateship term in relation to the alliance. Um, and, and you know, the other thing is uh, that while that, that mateship campaign played well in Washington, it did not play well back here in Australia. We did polling and figures on that. You know, it's also it was extraordinarily gender biased, I have to say. Um, so really, you know, 50% of the population found it difficult to associate with that and made even worse when they had all males as the original support crew there in Washington. But um, one of the things I reflect in that I'll say is like, yeah, we've been friends with America and we, we get along and suddenly we're, you know, we're, we're in the same cool group in the Indo-Pacific together and they're the kind of big kid on the block and they're paying much more attention to us and, um, than before and that's nice. But at the same time, we're kind of looking at going, yep, no, we want to do, and there's lots of things to align with. But there's a few things here we don't always, like I don't always want to go off and do what you want to do and hang out with you and do this, that, and the other. There's, um, you know, and, and that's that sort of different feel that's also happening within Australia. So there's, you know, continuing great support for the United States. But I did some, um, I did a report that came out at the end of last year on sort of Australia's views of the alliance. One of the things that it emphasizes was, talk less about sort of values of mateship and talk more about interests. What do we actually have in common? What are our strategic interests we can pursue together? Things like from climate change through to the regional balance of power and trade, as Haley said, and less talking about things that, um, you know, that are kind of that fluffy values and, um, and things that are hard to pin down. And of course, don't get me wrong, values are still important. We're still both liberal democracies. We still both believe in the rule of law. We still both believe in an open economic, well, parts of us do, an open economic system. and that. But there are tensions in that part of the relationship as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I might ask as well, you know, we spent some good time in Washington and one of the things that really struck me about being there was that you could walk down, just toddle along any kind of street and stumble across a think tank. Um, there's just so many think tanks with these beautiful buildings and, you know, marble foyers and all that kind of thing. They're lovely. Um, Don't get any ideas, Victoria. We're not getting a marble foyer. No, I had all these renovation plans. Ah, oh, disappointing. But um, I guess I wonder, you know, we didn't just spend time in the nice buildings. We also spoke with think tankers and we spoke with US government officials on foreign policy. And I guess I wonder, you know, like what are the differences between some of our think tanks and Washington think tanks or uh, think tanks in the US government in terms of the foreign policy direction of the United States? Do you think there's a synthesis in terms of how the US government's interpreting its foreign policy versus its think tanks? What do you think? Wow, that's a big question. Um, the difference between Australia and the US on think tanks is that in the United States, people who work in government transition in and out of think tanks, and that doesn't happen in Australia. Um, even though I've worked in government, I think I'm a bit unusual because either you stay working for government or you work for think tanks and academia in Australia. So in the US, they get this fantastic cross-pollination where you know when you're talking to think tankers, they might go into the administration one day so you could actually be influential. But also that's what I believe. It strengthens US policy because... To be frank, academia and theory provides a basis for some of the best ideas. And then when you go into government, you get a dose of reality. All your dreams get completely crushed. And then you realize exactly what you can and can't do. And have um, a melding of those two things is the perfect system for a democracy. In Australia, we have a different system. There's not as much philanthropy. It's very difficult to raise money in a lot of cases especially for independent, nonpartisan think tanks that don't have political affiliations. Uh, let me put a big sign on donors, please apply here. We will accept your money. <laughs> um, but what that means in the US system is that when you're talking to think tankers, uh, they're usually right on the money because they have more experience and points of contact into their administration so I think the view in the US about its foreign policy and how it's being shaped, one of the most interesting things is that um, Biden's administration is trying to pursue this foreign policy for the middle class. So in terms of this economic policy, that's all about how to protect American workers um, and improve labor conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in Australia, I don't think we think of foreign policy for average Australians. I don't think a lot of Australians – 
are necessarily minded towards foreign policy, although that really is shifting, I think, over the last few years in terms of what China has done with its economic coercion of a lot of Australian businesses, um, some of the threats in terms of its intellectual property theft, but also things with um, Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine. So, and to put, put it also, frankly, in Australia, because we have compulsory voting, you have this um, convergence of parties, a, a sort of race to the middle, and what that means is sometimes they're very similar in a lot of their policies. And so in like what we saw in the last election is they had to differentiate themselves through national security and whoever was tougher on China. In the United States context, they don't have compulsory voting. And so it's a race to the edges where you have people on both sides of the extreme. So that's what gets people out to vote. So you have very different dynamics in the political uh, makeups of both countries and in the think tanks. And that changes how average people in both countries think about their foreign policies. Look, I, I think there are a couple of interesting points there. Um, look, totally, the differences between the think tank community is really stark. Um, you know, I, I've kind of worked in government. Obviously, I worked for seven months on the DSR, sort of sitting inside the Department of Defence. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to work at ANU when we had the staff college contract. I've been in the army. I've done a few bits and pieces. But Haley's right, like, you know, you look at someone like Paul Dibb, for instance, um, you know, the, from the, the doyen of the Dibb Review and other things like that, you know, he ran, you know, uh, an intelligence agency. He was a deputy secretary, he did the Dibb Review, but he's also a professor with a PhD who wrote, you know, a really important book on the Soviet Union and things like that. And he's one of the few people I know who've ever gone in and out at a very high level. You know, if you look at someone like Hugh White, Hugh left the department as deputy secretary, went to ASPE and has never gone back into government. So it's, we have, it's a bit rare in the Australian system. And I think we're less for it. I think it would be a much better if there's more opportunity for people in government to come out and sit in think tanks on secondments and vice versa. Um, so you do get a bit of a rich, different environment in the United States. And I think one of the things about having some government experience or some experience within the system, you get to now understand what's the art of the possible versus, as Haley said, what's the art of the, you know, the theoretical understanding and the broad background of that. And, you know, I take, I remember reading Thomas Christensen's book on the China Challenge, where he talked about all his time as being a professor and lecturing things on international relations and trade, and then sitting in a room with Chinese officials in Beijing trying to hammer out trade deals and other deals and realizing what he was teaching and what he was doing, that there was a quite a big disconnect between those two things. Um, so there's a place for both of those things. It's, you know, and I think really the think tank world is where you try and draw those two things together. Um, and I think that's where we offer a unique opportunity. And it's a bit of a different system in the United States. Obviously, the alliance is taking on new importance, but are there any areas of concern that are impacting cooperation between our two countries? Yes, yeah, so I think the major area of concern for the relationship is actually in the economic and trade space, and that's mainly because we're seeing this incredible shift intact by the United States to implement far-reaching industrial policy, domestic US policy, um, including under a couple of different Acts. So the first one is the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA or IRA, and the other one is the Chips and Science Act. Now, taken together, these two agreements are about a couple of different things, and they're not all good and they're not all bad, um, but they've got different aspects. So one of them, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, is about bringing manufacturing jobs back to America. It's also about reducing carbon emissions through subsidies for electronic vehicles and battery components. And then the Chips and Science Act is all about getting more semiconductor chips, these advanced uh, microchips used in almost every single electronic device, getting more of those into American supply chains. But where these two domestic acts come into a bit of a problem for Australia is that the US is trying to change global supply chains through implementing its domestic legislation, and that could have negative uh, carry-on effects for US partners and allies. So we've already seen this in relation to the IRA in terms of the US subsidizing its own domestic electronic vehicle uh, manufacturing base, which means it's undercutting other manufacturers, including in US allies like South Korea and in some European countries. Um, and 
what this is really meaning for Australia is in one sense, it could be very good for Australia because as subsidies for electric vehicles go up, all of the components needed for the batteries in those vehicles, like lithium ore, will also go up with the higher consumption. Because Australia is the largest lithium producer in the world, we stand to export more of our stuff, which is good. But it also means that there's other parts of the legislation that make it very difficult for Australian companies to receive any kind of investment from China. So, for example, if you're currently a lithium company now and you have anything uh, to do with China or a Chinese company, in a few years' time, you might not be able to be eligible for any of the kind of US subsidies or other um, tax relief if you are still associated with that Chinese company. So I guess the difference here is that in the US, the US is seeing a lot of, if not all, Chinese investment as bad investment, whereas in the Australian context, we see things quite a bit differently. So the US is in the midst of creating workarounds for partners and allies to be able to access things under the IRA. And I think also it might need to tinker with its Chips and Science Act in future. But this is a real area we're going to have to continue working very closely with the United States on. And it is also trying to uh, patch up its legislation as it goes. But because things are moving so quickly, I think the US has even itself said that it has moved too fast and it's made some mistakes. So that's where we really have to work more closely with the US so that we can avoid this kind of thing in future. Pete, I'll ask the same question to you. Are there any areas of concern that are impacting cooperation between our two countries? From my perspective um, in the work that I do, particularly on defence policy, defence industrial base, I'd have to say another acronym to throw at the listeners, ITAR, which is the US International Trade in Arms Regulation. So this is run out of the US State Department, and it basically regulates, you know, um, the transfer of technology, the transfer of intellectual property, anything that can be related to, um, to, to basically the transfer of this technology. Now, that becomes really critical to the way that AUKUS operates. And there's a lot of problems, most people would say, with the ITAR um, base. It's tried to be reformed several times before. So there's been attempts at industrial integration, technology sharing through the Defence Cooperation Treaty of 2012 with Australia, and then Australia's addition to the National um, Technology and Industrial Base in um, 2017. But what we're going to have to see is reform to ITAR, so it's kind of a third bite of the apple at uh, reforming US export controls. Because one of the big things is, is ITAR at the moment doesn't, what I would say, you know, provide affirmative action or positively dis discriminate. So it doesn't say, for instance, the AUKUS countries, the US, uh, sorry, UK and Australia, that we get preferential treatment. We, we get treated the same as any other sort of customer turning up who wanting, wanting to get involved, even though the AUKUS deal makes it a very different um, arrangement. This is a very uh, complex um, piece of um, legislation. It's very nerdy for those who get involved. But for those who are involved in it and know it stuff, um, it is a really complex area, as I said, but it's really important um, to be able to get better um, you know, industrial sharing and defence cooperation sharing and technology sharing. So I think the real key is that the ITAR provisions were created for a different strategic era in a different strategic age. And if you're going to pull out a piece of paper and in the era of great power strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific and the importance of allies to integrated deterrence, you would not design ITAR the way it is at the moment. So you have to reform ITAR. And of course, there's lots of special interests involved here. There's the defense industry community, there's the labor unions, there's the Senate, there's the House of Representatives, there's the business community, there's the Pentagon, there's the State Department, there's a whole range of... The list goes on and on and on. And... So what we really probably need is a multi-pronged approach to this. And I have to say, when we're in the US, overwhelmingly, the people in the White House and the Pentagon, they want to get on and they want to solve these issues. Um, and, you know, the people we spoke to up on the Hill in Congress also want to do that, but it's difficult to unpack this. Um, so it's going to need executive level, so White House executive order um, in place, but it can't just be the White House driving this. To cement these powers, we need the US Congress needs to consider legislation that clarifies what the executive branch discretion can be around streamlining export controls and how we can sort of 
give affirmative action to the AUKUS um, nations. Now, this is not just also about AUKUS. Um, over the longer term, this has to go more broadly because what we're seeing in strategic competition in the war in Ukraine has shown what we really need to do is do broader defence industrial-based collaboration. And this is no longer about you know the US being the you know the leader of uh, or the hegemon in many of these areas and able to control access to technology and stuff. This is about a much more flatter structure, much more sharing, um, and that's easy to say, very difficult to do. But it's it's an absolutely essential piece of what we're doing. And and to give uh, a plug to one of my staff and some of the work we're doing here. Um, we've recently re released on the 17th of May a report called Breaking the Barriers, Reforming U.S. Export Controls to Realize the Potential of AUKUS. Tom Corbin from the um, Foreign Policy and Defense Teams worked on this. But the lead author of this is Dr. William Greenwalt. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And he is one of the architects of uh, you know, the earlier attempts to reforms of bringing Australia into the national defense industrial base. He's a former Under Secretary of Defence for Defence Industry Policy. He's a, one of the world's experts on this stuff. So there's some really practical ways to progress this forward. Um, and I think that's a central reading for anyone who's interested in the success or not of AUKUS and uh, people who are interested in this broader defence industrial debate that we have to have, particularly from the lessons that Ukraine are giving us. A great response and shout out to Tom Corbin for all his work on the ITAR reforms. Um, threading the needle on Australia's side, it's great. Um, thanks for explaining the importance of that as well, Pete. That's fantastic. I'm keen to get a favourite statistic or fact or news report or study, um, something that we might have missed. So which one did you choose? Well, uh, um, I have to say the favourite statistical fact is, is one of our own, one of yours actually, Victoria, from the, the polling data. And that is the significant change that we've seen in the United States about their view of Australia's security to um, the security of the United States. So we've seen a jump in since we last did the polling data um, to, you know, from I think 44% of Americans who thought Australia's security was important to the security of the United States to 58%. Now that is a significant jump forward. I think that has a lot to do with the AUKUS announcement. But I think this is part of the broader recognition by the public in the United States of America that the United States allies and partners and particularly key allies like Japan and Australia in the Indo-Pacific are actually becoming really critical to America's role in the region and America's security. Now, we know America's a big power and we're a small power or a middle power with small power potentials, however you want to view us. But uh, so there's a very great asymmetry in the relationship between the two. But the gap in that asymmetry is shrinking because we're becoming more and more important to the United States. That's not just reflected now in U.S. Um, policy of integrated deterrence and what we saw in their national defense strategy and national security strategy, but it's being reflected now in the American public who understand this as well. Yeah, that's great. That 14% increase from, I think it was 2021 figures in Americans saying that their alliance relationships benefit their security. That's great. Thank you so much again for joining us. We look forward to chatting with you again and hearing more from you in the future. Just before we go, I'd like to point out a couple of other podcasts that might be of interest. We have our technology and security podcast, TS, run by Dr. Mia hammond Airy, USSC's Director of Magic Technology, as well as our USSC live series that runs recording from our major live events. Recent episodes include our interview with Qantas CEO Alan Joyce and former US Ambassador John Berry. Our researcher responses to the AUKUS report and our panel discussion with the cast of Hamilton Australia. You can find these on our website, ussc.edu.au or wherever you get your podcasts. 